So um, God used all that culminating at the same point to make me slow down to kind of figure out like, what, what do I want my life to be about in this next 40 years, you know? And so I am super grateful for the halftime program. I highly recommend the book and the program, but through that, this is a long winded answer of saying, how did we ultimately decide to start giving away the majority and most years, a hundred percent of the profits. I was talking to my halftime coach and I was like, man, I'm just not like feeling a lot of purpose. Like I've done this for a long time. It's been great financially and otherwise, but like I, it just doesn't scratch the itch it used to. And he was like, well, you're definitely kind of in a halftime season. And he said, have you ever thought about using your business uh, as a platform for impact? And I said, well, I've always been very generous because we were the recipients of tons of charity as a kid, like tons of people helped me in my life. And, you know, the water heater goes out. It was like my family is taking cold showers until God provide that money through a person, you know? And so people consistently showed up. So ever since I had made money, I'd always been super generous with it. But I used to have this mental break, like the company makes money the money comes to me and then me and my wife choose to give it away. But it wasn't like, it wasn't like, hey, the business is the vehicle for generosity. It just happens to pay me well and then we can choose to give it away or spend yeah. it or do whatever. And this guy, I had never really thought through the concept. He's like, no, the veh- the business is the vehicle. Like you can be generous with your team members. You can be generous with the excess funds, with the community. You can have a radical impact on all your hotel guests and your vendors and all these tenants. And you know, you guys, like we always encourage our team, like we, we will impact more lives every year than a mega church. Well, I've got Micah Locker here with me today. He runs Anchor Investments in Nashville, Tennessee and has properties across the South, Southeast and Midwest. And we had this amazing conversation at an event a few months back and it's fascinated, fascinated me ever since. So I'm so glad to have him on the podcast today. Micah, thanks for joining me. Thanks, Travis. I'm excited. Looking forward to catching up with you. I'm going to start here in your philosophy on real estate. Since you're in real estate, I'm just going to jump right right into that. But I, I, I heard this quote from you, from I think a mentor of yours. It says, it doesn't take money to do real estate. It takes great projects. And that just kind of, you know, was, was really interesting because I think most people look at real estate in the, the sense of like, you're in it for the money, but this is a different idea. And then we'll kind of get into your projects that I think are so incredibly fascinating, but tell me a little, a little bit about that philosophy and how that shifted your mindset on your profession today. That's a, that's a great question. I mean, the, the backstory on that quote, honestly changed my career. The backstory on that was, is I had grown up in a family that had very little means and my dad had raised us to, Hey, you got to go get a job. Like be a professional lawyer, doctor, you know, go, go to college, be an excellent student, go to college. You're going to have to pay for it, but then go to graduate school and be a medical doctor or something. And then you'll, you'll always have enough money to provide for your family. And anyway, I won't get into all that, but I ended up ultimately going to UT for college and uh, getting straight into the real estate business in Nashville 20 years ago. And I started out as a broker and uh, the guys that actually owned our company were real estate investors, but they also owned a brokerage company. They office next door to us. And so I was learning the business and I'd go up there over there and catch up with them sometimes. And whenever they had a project, they call it in our business passing the hat, but they would give all of us an opportunity to invest. And obviously I had just paid for college and had no money and student debt and everything else. And one day I made the comment to Nelson Crow, who was my boss. I said, man, I said, I heard y'all raising money on this deal. I said, my dream is to like, make, you know, I'd love to invest with you guys one day. I can't wait till I make a little bit of money so I can start like putting money in and being an investor. And he said, if you ever say that again, I'll smack you. He said, I said, what do you mean? And he said, man, it doesn't take money to do real estate deals. It takes great projects. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like, how do you do deals with no money? And he said, well, if you go find a really good deal with great returns, I'll give you equity for nothing. And I'm like, you'll give me ownership for free. He said, yeah, it's called sweat equity. Have you never heard of it? And I said, no, man, I don't even, I thought like you had to have money. My dad always said, you got to have money to make money. And, you know, rich people get richer, poor people like us stay poor. And, and, you know, it's hard to get ahead. And I, I didn't realize. And he said, yeah, man, you go find a building and depending on the returns, I'll give you 10, 20, 30, 40% ownership in that project as long as the returns make sense. So 
that flipped the switch. I was like, all right, I'm going to go start finding, like, I'm going to keep doing brokerage, but I'm going to start going to find real estate investments because ultimately I want to build a passive income stream to provide for my family and give me some financial freedom, you know, over time. So that that's the background of that quote, which honestly just changed my whole career. I could only imagine. So was that when you started in 2009, you jumped out on your own and you, you started looking for your own projects around that time? Well, that was actually uh, probably 2004. And then I, I left in 2005 to start a, a company, a development company. I started Anchor in 2009. So we're 14 years old now, but I had a prior business for four years doing uh, retail development, following Walmart around the Southeast. But that's ultimately when I jumped out of the brokerage business and got on the equity side of the business. That's fascinating. So and you have some interesting, there's so many things I want to ask you, but I know we have a limited amount of time. You do some interesting things on, um, in your hospitality side compared to your commercial side, but tell me about 2009 and the hardship of like starting something on the back end of a reset, a significant recession in real estate. Yes. Um, uh, unless somebody sees a video of this, they can't tell that I'm extremely gray, but, uh, <laughs> I think the great recession, uh, probably added, but, um, so the background was, so I left in 2005 to be a partner in a company called Hall Rob and open a Nashville office for them. They were one of my clients. I was finding them land sites in middle Tennessee through my brokerage business and a really great man, uh, named Bob Talbot gave me the opportunity. He was based in Knoxville and he recruited me to open this office, uh, with him. And so, you know, we're blowing and going. And then the great financial crisis hits. Thankfully, we were very conservative and we had gotten really spooked by the market and uh, valuations and rents that you, and construction costs were crazy and land prices. So we had really stopped developing. But unfortunately, we had a couple projects that were under construction when the GFC hit. And I have a little cartoon on my desk that says, a banker is a man that offers you an umbrella when the sun's out and asks for it back when it begins to rain. And that was our story because I was the young hustler and Bob was the money man. And when our projects would have been fine, but the banks immediately cut our funding mid construction. And so, I mean, we had to start funding out of cash and we ran, I mean, Bob had versions of me all over the country. So ultimately he ran out of money and, um, and it was super tough. And so part of my story was I stayed on with Bob for about a year to help him. And I love Bob. He's a great man. He sadly recently passed away, but I, he had a profound impact on my life. But I started Anchor while helping him unwind stuff at Hall Rob. And um, so frankly, Anchor, we had fresh capital, no problems. And, and there was a lot of cheap real estate. So this company has been up and to the right since we started. I mean, of course we've had blips along the way, but like we started when the market hit bottom, but I definitely greatly experienced the financial crisis because it took a couple of years to unwind those two partnerships and make sure the banks could treat us fairly and give us an opportunity to get, get done with all that. But it was, it was unbelievably challenging. And, you know, every lender says they're in the uh, quote unquote relationship lending business. Very few are. They are when the market's hot. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I tell our bankers now, and I mean this humbly, we spend more time interviewing our banks than they spend interviewing us because I'm like, it's great. You guys want to loan us money now because the market's great. But like, what are you going to do if we hit a financial crisis? Like, we need you to partner with us because we're going to pay our bills. Like, we're not the type to walk away from our debts, but you can't call our loans. We wouldn't borrow the money if we had the liquidity just to pay for everything in cash. Like, there's a reason we're borrowing money. Yeah. And how do you transition? So as you start your company, were you thinking about, because what you do with your, your hospitality side, which is hotels, boutique hotels, is you give a majority of the profits to underserved communities, which I think is, is, is incredible. It's, it's a business model that I'm sure not a lot of people are like, hey, I'm going to take the majority of my profits and give them to uh, nonprofits or underserved communities um, as you're building a company, especially as you have investors and you have to go to those investors and say, hey, we're doing this unique thing. But I think the way I understand it is that the commercial side of your companies help kind of facilitate your ability to serve on the hospitality side, which is your hotels and your, your lodging space. How do you even get into that, that mindset where you're going to do that? Did you have like commercial successes and you're like, all right, we want to kind of 
you bought a couple churches and these like unique properties in Nashville that are really cool. And how, how do you get there? Well, it's a great question. I mean, early on, frankly, I didn't have the means to do it, but you know, God has blessed our business on the commercial side. And so, I mean, <laughs> I'm not like, well, I don't think many people are, but it's not like I had some grand vision. It's like one day I'm going to buy these churches and I'm just going to convert them and give sure. the money away. You know, you just take life faithfully step by step. And so we did an excellent job for our investors and hustled. Well, as we recovered from the financial crisis, a lot of this real estate we bought cheap, we were able to turn. And, you know, for the first time really in my life, I had excess means. And so a friend of mine, when Airbnb launched, one of my buddies, over the years, I just kept meeting guys. I'd go have coffee. I, I didn't have the uh, the best relationship with my dad growing up. So I've always sought out mentors in my life. So I just take men to coffee and breakfast. Hey, how do you be a great dad, husband, business guy, generous community member? And I was always picking, I meet these guys and I'm like, what do you do for a living? They're like, uh, I don't really work anymore. Like I just do like, you know, community stuff or ministry or politics. And I'm like, how do you do that? Like, how do you pay your bills? They're like, oh, when I was your age, I started buying rental houses and I'd buy one or two a year. So that really resonated. I met like multiple guys in a row and they're like, I own 20 rental houses now. Like, so I can just like volunteer all my time because I have this <laughs> portfolio. And I was like, man, that's so cool. So me and one of my good buddies just started buying one or two rental houses a year, just like playing this playbook. And, you know, at the time, you didn't have to put a whole lot of money down. The banks would basically loan you 100%, but we'd go buy good rental houses and pay down the debts. And so when Airbnb launched, uh, we read an article about it and we're like, oh, that's a great, idea. it's cool. Like, why don't we try it? You know, let's go buy $10,000 of furniture, furnish one of these cool houses in a cool neighborhood in Nashville and try this Airbnb thing. And if it doesn't work, we'll just rent it as furnished housing, you know? And so we did it. And and that was early days of air. I mean, it, there's probably 10,000 units on Airbnb in Nashville now. It's like one of the hottest markets in the country. When we started, I think there were like 300 houses on there. And so we were early adapters and it was just crushing it. So we immediately converted all of our rental houses into Airbnbs. <laughs> How many we're like, man, rentals was that at the time? I mean, we probably had 30 or 40 at the time. So we were, but it was super inefficient trying to manage yeah. like how, you know, so ultimately we had to build a management company to, to handle it. But like, cause we didn't want to, you know, all weekend be dealing with that so we could hang out with our families and stuff. So, uh, but even but the has got to be hard, right? Like me, I manage these <laughs> short-term rentals for my in-laws. There's three little cabins in Northern Missouri. And the, I mean, they, they pay for themselves now. Cause I'd for, I not forced, I convinced them to put them on Airbnb, but it's really the only place to stay in North Missouri are these couple little cabins in a really gorgeous location. But I can't imagine running a management company and, and really that not just being exhausting. It's, it's a lot. And thankfully we found a great guy to run that, but yeah, I mean, it's a lot. You think about it. I mean, things come up, people are staying there and you know, they're on vacation. So any, you know, toilet goes all at bad and it's like, they need somebody to fix it immediately. It's not like, Oh, let's wait till Monday when we get back to the office. So but anyway, I had told my partner in that, I said, hey, man, I'd really like to find a building where if we could put a bunch of these in one building, run it at a hotel quality level of service. Because the problem with Airbnb is, I mean, probably anybody listening, like you could say an Airbnb and it's unbelievable. And then you see one online that looks great. And you're like, oh, man, bad neighborhood. Like the pictures were not the reality of where I stayed. And sure. you can't get in touch with the host. And, you know, there's just not like not everybody serves people excellently. So. Anyway, we found a building uh, downtown on behalf of one of my retail clients. And they're like, hey, we want to lease. And I was like, well, we'll go buy the building, plug you guys in because they couldn't buy the real estate. And um, and it had these beautiful, it was an old apartment store. I mean, the building's like 125 years old. Nobody had occupied the upper floors for like 60 years. and But they had beautiful bones, but it was just kind of bombed out. And um, and I was like, man, if I'm ever going to try this, like this is the building to do it. So I built six units in that building and, um, and started, uh, you know, Airbnb in it. And then we came up with a program. I mean, I always laugh in real estate. There's no original idea. We call it uh, rooms for rooms. And it really was based off the of Tom's model, like buy a shoe, give a shoe. Yeah. And we were like, hey, if you rent a room from us, people at the homeless mission will have a, a warm bed meal and shower, 
you know, and it equated to like 16 nights at the mission, just how they calculate like what a night cost. And so we just said, Hey, we'll start giving away a percentage of the profits. And it was just a way to connect guests with generosity. Um, and so fast forward, what happened was, is I went through a program, uh, about six or seven years ago called Halftime. It's based on a book by a guy named Bob Buford. The book's called Halftime, but they have a leadership development program in Dallas. And now we actually have an office that we've opened here in Nashville. So people in Nashville can go through the program. But um, part of my story is simultaneously, six years ago, uh, my oldest brother died of a, a lifelong health struggle. Uh, mm -hmm. I had my first child. And then I had some team members internally that, frankly, we're just not doing the right things. And, uh, and I had a lot of issues internally that I didn't even know about. Like they just weren't doing the right things, frankly. And all this culminated at the same time. Like I had to get rid of multiple staff members. I'm dealing with the drama of my brother dying unexpectedly, even though he'd been sick for a long time, you're never ready for someone to pass. We just thought like the next medical procedure will buy him enough time for the next one. And but like within a 90 day period, all this stuff happened. And it was like the lowest low losing a sibling who I was super close with and having my first child, which I had always dreamed of being a dad because my dad just didn't have a great relationship with any of his five children. And so it was like, man, I just have always wanted to be a great dad. And like, wow. I was, so, and, I, and I was like 37 years old by the time I had my first kid. So I was a late, late bloomer. Um, and so I, uh, that is all culminated at the same point. It was super rough. And, um, and so I was talking to the guy that's coached me through the halftime program. And I was like, man, I think I might just sell my business. Like, I was like, I might just reset my whole life. Like our business has been very successful. Uh, I could just, it, it's very sellable. We could exit. I'd have some liquidity, just reevaluate my whole life and then figure out like what I want to do. Do I want to run a nonprofit? Do I want to get back in real estate? Do I want to, you know, go be like on staff with Young Life? I was like, what do I want to do? So um, God used all that culminating at the same point to make me slow down to kind of figure out like what, what do I want my life to be about in this next 40 years, you know? And so I am. Um, Super grateful for the halftime program. I highly recommend the book and the program. But through that, this is a long-winded answer of saying, how did we ultimately decide to start giving away the majority and most years, 100% of the profits? I was talking to my halftime coach and I was like, man, I'm just not like feeling a lot of purpose. Like I've done this for a long time. It's been great financially and otherwise, but like I, it just doesn't scratch the itch it used to. And he was like, well, you're definitely kind of in a halftime season. And he said, have you ever thought about using your business uh, as a platform for impact? And I said, well, I've always been very generous because we were the recipients of tons of charity as a kid, like tons of people helped me in my life. And, you know, the water heater goes out. It was like my family is taking cold showers until God provide that money through a person, you know? And so people consistently showed up. So ever since I had made money, I'd always been super generous with it. But I used to have this mental break, like the company makes money the money comes to me and then me and my wife choose to give it away. But it wasn't like, it wasn't like, Hey, the business is the vehicle for generosity. It just happens to pay me well. And then we can choose to give it away or spend yeah. it or do whatever. And this guy, I had never really thought through the concept. He's like, no, the V the business is the vehicle. Like you can be generous with your team members. You can be generous with the excess funds, with the community. You can have a radical impact on all your hotel guests and your vendors and all these tenants. And you know, you guys, like we always encourage our team, like we, we will impact more lives every year than a mega church. You know, like we, we have a, you sure. know, we have uh, 10 to 15,000 hotel guests a year. We have hundreds of tenants, hundreds of vendors, 20 team members. So he's like, this business makes a difference. Like you don't have to go run a nonprofit. You just run your business with a different lens and it can be um, the impact. And he was like asking about the hotels and he was like, why wouldn't you just do more hotels? and like, just give away the money. Like, he's like, you seem to love it. It's fun. You love restoring these old churches and saving them from demolition. Yeah. And he's like, why wouldn't you just go find more churches and scale that business? And it can be a, a huge funding mechanism for th tons of this inner city work that you're interested in. And I was like, never thought about that. That's a great idea. He's like, just scale that business and keep doing your shopping center business. 
you know, to provide for your family, but just go scale your hotel business. So that's really when we started to kind of take off six years ago and be strategic about, okay, we're going to go buy more buildings, mainly churches, turn them into hospitality. And then we're just committed publicly. We're committed to giving the majority of the funds, but every year we pretty much give a hundred way or hundred percent away just, uh, as long as we don't have to like reinvest it in the building to fix things or whatever. That's awesome. And I, I read this uh, quote you did in a news article. It says, it's fun to think that these churches, because you, you're buying churches, you're turning them into like boutique hotels, which is, <laughs> is so cool to me. And you said, it's fun to think that these churches did ministry in their neighborhoods for years and they're still doing ministry by people staying with us and us being able to give money away to support those most in need. The fact that you've got a mission on top of the purchase of those churches where undoubtedly the Lord's work was being done in various form and fashion is really cool. And does that give, I mean, you know, you just mentioned it. I think it is part of your purpose, but it's got to feel really sweet to repurpose those into something that is thinking through mission on the back end. Absolutely. Like, you know, I've had people, when we've bought these churches, you'll have people that are like kind of longtime churchgoers say, do you feel bad that you're like converting a church into a hotel? I'm like, absolutely not. I was like, the definition of a church is to minister to people. And that could come in the form of a Sunday service or a feeding program or whatever. But like, Sadly, in urban America, you know, many more churches are closing every day. We're not buying vibrant churches and kicking them out. We're buying the ones where sadly, you know, they had hundreds of members and then now they have 10 and they can barely keep the lights on. And you don't want to demolish these beautiful facilities because they don't build them like that anymore. They don't build them, dude. And I always tell my friends in construction, I'm like, you couldn't with modern construction, it would cost like a thousand dollars a foot. The qua- the craftsmanship, I mean, it's impossible. The level of detail, like sadly in our industry, we've lost that. But like these are just beautiful structures. And Nashville is such a booming market. If we don't sure. buy them, most people are going to tear them down and build townhomes or apartments or whatever. And so I was like, I don't feel one bit bad. Like I'm like, man, we're saving these churches. And yeah. now they're just ministering to people by giving them a great place to sleep and whether they believe in God or religion or anything else, we're using their money to go help all these people that really need it through all of our charity partners. And like, so they're having a chance to be generous, whether they want to be or not. So it's just super fun to think it's like these churches are are doing the Lord's work in these communities, but through a for-profit business. How are you thinking through the future of that? Are there a lot of churches that you have like on a list of like, I want to buy this church or this church is dead or they want, there's a discussion of demolishing this church. And is it just Nashville? Are you going now? Are you expanding across, you know, areas? Well, uh, So yeah, two different things there. So we are talking to some denominations in the next season, like a lot of people don't realize this, but like the Methodist church and the Catholic church, they actually own all the real estate, the big church. It's not like the local first Methodist. They don't actually even own their property. So we're talking to them about like some of these churches, frankly, are just not going to survive in the next five years. I mean, the, the, the people going, it's just the population is just going down uh, that goes every week. And so they can't fund themselves. So we're like, Hey, why don't you sell them to us? And like we're going to give the money away. So it's like, it's a great mission alignment. Like you guys can feel good that you're just not selling to somebody that's going to convert it to apartments or whatever. Like we'll, we'll do the church's work, but through the hotels. So that's the oh next gosh. season. We got to talk offline about that. Cause I, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but it just reminded me, I, I've, I've got to ask you about this local church that I just need to discuss with you, but I'm sorry to interrupt. I shouldn't have. No, done. you're fine. Yeah. So it's, uh, so yes, we're, I mean, We've gotten a decent bit of media attention because I always joke like we we brand ourselves the only hotel company in America that gives away the majority of the profits. I always say, sadly, I think we'll always be because like it's like a crazy idea. Who else, like, yeah, who else that, do that? yeah, and if it was our only business, frankly, we wouldn't be able to give away all the profits because I do have a family to feed. But like, sure. thankfully, we have this other business that uh, does provide for our staff and families, and so. Um, but yeah, so like, I believe there'll be more churches that resound with our mission. And it's like, we, sometimes we can't pay what the guy who's just going to tear it down and build a high rise can. We're like, man, y'all don't really need the money. Like, what are y'all going to do? You're not like relocating to another campus. It's just shutting down this location. So 
most of them would just give the money away anyway. The congregation will at the end. So I was like, hey, why don't you sell it to us? We'll pay you as much as we can, you know, but like, why don't you just sell it to us and let us go do this? And it, it, we're committed to giving it away anyway. So, so we're excited about that. As far as your question on other markets, we have told people if, if somebody in Columbia, Missouri wants to do this, I'll give them the business model. Like I don't for free, you know, I'll tell them how to do it. It is such a high uh, touch business. I mean, anytime you deal with consumers, it, we're not to a point where we're ready to like go to Dallas if we decided to go to Dallas, we'd have to do three or four at the same time because you need the scale to build a team. Um, we can't do just one random one in Dallas, one random one in you know Columbia, Missouri. So I've told people or on interviews like this, it's like, hey, if you're interested in doing this, I'll tell you exactly how we did it. As long as you're committed to giving money away, I'll share the whole business with you. Um, but I do see a season down the road where we would launch in another city. We just need to do it with a couple prop. Like if the Methodist church came to me and said, Hey, I got three buildings in Charleston. We're shutting down. We love your mission. I would go do that. Like we would, we would launch a team member to go start a new market. Yeah. That's so fascinating. And the, the real estate stuff is, you know, there's just so many pieces to it. You have a commercial side, which, you know, I, I think is fascinating, but not near in my mind, my mind, just because my own interests is as the boutique hotels and the opportunity there and then what you're doing with it as a mission as opposed to just we're you know we're making a killing because we're in nashville and this place is super popular and we have these boutique cool hotels but that we're giving it away to people that are undoubtedly in need in nashville because it's growing and that's gonna put people out on the streets and there's all kinds of issues anyway that's really that's an that's amazing man i i love that piece of it i loved reading about it and studying it about you and your work. And it, it made me really wonder, like, how does this even, how do you even do this? <laughs> and the commercial, it makes sense with the commercial side having so much success. And I see you, you all purchase places around the country and even in Cleveland. I'm really excited about that. You know, I was born and raised, not raised, but born in Cleveland, Ohio. So love to see that you're investing in Cleveland too. But um, how is that? How do you think the, about the future of your business? on the commercial side and then also like the mission side, because you said you had kind of the like identity crisis time where you're like, what do I do? Yeah. So good question. I mean, we definitely have a strong mission on the commercial side, but we do not give away investors money. Um, you know, it's funny when I interview investors, they're like, so this cool, you are so generous, but like, <laughs> is this going to mess up my return? And I'm like, well, I said, we're committed. Every partnership we are involved with as a company, we do choose two to three charity partners a year, but it, we don't give away uh, nearly. Now, my team, we choose to take our profits and be super generous with our portion. But I tell my investors, it's not my job to give away their money. If they want to join us, like we'll tell them who we're supporting and they're welcome to you know contribute as well. But like that's me and my team giving the money away, not, not their money um, on the commercial side. But like, even if we didn't do that, you know, like you mentioned a shopping center in Cleveland, like we feel very strongly we have a great mission because a lot of these centers we buy, they're just dead. You know, they're half occupied. They've had a bad owner who took every ounce of cash flow, put it in their pocket and didn't reinvest. And over time, the roof leaks, the landscaping looks terrible. And, you know, people are like, well, this is a decent location, but I'm not going to that shopping center. It looks like, a, you know, third world country over there. So, you know, we, what we have done is, is we're like, hey, we're going to go in there, spend the money bring it back to life, retented it, bring jobs back to the community, bring sales tax dollars back to the community, give vendors a place to work. So, you know, we feel strongly like we can have a huge impact to our commercial business as well, just by making people proud. A lot of the work we do is in smaller towns and it's like our shopping centers become the hub of that community. And so, you know, we're letting the Boy Scouts do Christmas tree sales and, you know, there's, the car guys doing their donuts and coffee on Saturday morning. It's like, we want the, it to be where for years that was just for the last 20 years. It was like, Oh, that nobody went to that place. It was like, there was two tenants left. And so, um, you know, we're going to keep doing it. Like we're, I mean, I have such a renewed energy and passion for our business. Um, 
you know, where I had lost that for a season, but like now I'm like, man, I want to bring more people in. I want to grow the company, get more opportunities in my team and we can keep growing and expanding the company and give a lot of opportunity. And we can go impact more people in these communities we work in and give them something they're proud of and, you know, keep jobs in the community and sales tax revenue and everything else these communities need. That's great. And as you've, have you, as you've been more generous, have you seen the result like blow you like blow you away? Has it been like, you know, we we know that we're being generous and so there's been this give and take or as you've been as you've given more and kind of loosened the grip on some of some of that you've felt like it's been blessed. Absolutely. I mean, I don't believe in the prosperity gospel, but like sure. yeah. it is interesting how like the more you give, like, I just feel like our company just keeps like having more success and we're giving away more and more money every year, higher percentages, but it's like, there's more money to give away. It's like the profits keep going up and you're like, that doesn't make sense because we're giving more away every year. It seems like it should either be the same or going down, but it's like, we just continue to be more blessed. You know, now I've had seasons where that wasn't the case, but lately it does feel like the more you give, the more you get. And even if you didn't get financially, it's just the the impact. I mean, the amount of last year we supported a hundred nonprofits as a company and the stories, the letters they send us, we get to go to their banquets and stuff. It's like, it doesn't matter if we made half of what we used to make. It's just, you can't put a value on the impact stories you get and all these people you're helping because I mean, you know, this Travis through all your political work. And I know you have such a huge heart, like the sit, the American system doesn't work for everybody, you know, especially in a city like Nashville, it's like, well, the, the upper 10 to 20% of people, this, this 20 year bull market in Nashville has just made people so fortunate. But like, to your point, there's a lot more homeless people because it's gotten a lot more unaffordable and groceries are more expensive and gas is, everything's more expensive. And so for a lot of families, for my family growing up, that would have been a crisis. You know, it's like, well, groceries doubling. It's like, well, we're just going to have to eat more unhealthy food and, you know, whatever the cheapest thing you can find at the grocery store. And, you know, it's like, so like I believe in the American system is the greatest system, but it doesn't always work for everybody. And that's why we're really involved in like workforce training and stuff, because we want to give people the opportunity to provide for their families. But some people need the job skills to be able to go get that job, to make a little more money where they're not paycheck to paycheck, just barely scraping by. Yeah. And what, what's the impact you've seen on your team? I could, I can't imagine there's maybe a better place to work than a place that's on a mission to help others while also being success, a successful business. I mean, probably people talk about it, but they're probably not doing it on the level you're doing it. No, I mean, from a talent recruitment, if you're a mission driven person, we have a lot of people that want to work for us, you know, and I mean that humbly, but it's like, I always tell people, especially in my world, and I'm not judging anybody on what they decide I mean, I to want do. I for you, by the way. I, <laughs> one <of> your <laughs> I always joke with my interns. I want to come back in my next life and be an intern at Anchor. I'm like, these guys yeah. get treated a lot better than I did as intern <laughs> in college. Like, <laughs> It's like we're, we actually give them meaningful work to do. Like, and they're like, we give them responsibilities and pay them. I was like, man, this wasn't existed when I was. Yeah. What are you doing? uh, You need to send them out there. Sink or swim, baby. That's what you got. (laughs) I've told them I'm spoiling them. I'm like, you're going to get a real job and you're going to be like, this sucks. But, uh, so, um, but you know, obviously things are not perfect. I'm the first to admit it here, but like, you know, for a mission driven person, it is a great place to work because, I say this with no judgment to people, but like, you know, at a lot of real estate or private equity companies around the country, the employees have this sense that I'm working very hard so the owner can go live this fabulous life and fly around his plane and do all these things. I said, Hey, the great news at Anchor is is I've capped my income on an annual basis. So like, you need to know the more that we're blessed with, that's going to be shared with the team. It's going to be shared with the community and we're going to give it away. So like, we're either going to reinvest in the business or we're going to take a portion of it, reinvest in the business. We're going to get a portion of it and give it away. And then we're going to take a portion of it and give it back to the team. So it's like, like 
you're not like my lifestyle is not going to change no matter how big this company grows. So it's like, I said, that's encouraging for people. Cause I'm, I was once an employee and I remember that feeling of like, this is great. They're paying me fairly for what I'm doing. But like the more money this company makes, it just means my boss lives this much more fabulous life and it's not going to affect me one bit. I'm like, and you're getting to see all these people that we're truly changing people's lives. And so that, that, and, and I've encouraged a team. I was like, listen, I own the business and 20% of my job, I don't love, you know, it's like, we're not to the scale where I can just outsource everything. And there's, I have to do all this reporting for the banks and stuff on a quarterly basis. And I do not like love filling out these paperwork. And, but I have to remind myself, I tell them, I was like, when you're doing that kind of work, when I do that kind of work, I'm thinking about the people tonight at the homeless mission who are going to get a, a warm meal and shower and come off the street after three or four days. And I was like, it doesn't feel as painful filling out that paperwork for the bank. Or I'm thinking about the teen mom, like we're involved with the teen mom ministry. I mean, there'll be 80 moms this Christmas who buy kid, a presents for their kids and themselves for Christmas. I'm like, I'm thinking about that 17 year old girl from the inner city who's got a three month old and I'm 43 with three young children and it's hard enough on me. I can't imagine being 17. So I'm like, you know, I'm, it's, I'm thinking about that, those people. And I remind them, I was like, we all, nobody in America has a job where they love a hundred percent. I mean, you right. know, I always joke, if it was that fun, we wouldn't pay you to do it. Like, you know, yeah. so it's, it is called work. You got to have employees that are like kicking the door in for you though. Like, I, I, I yeah, mean, we, a team that's like cohesive, excited thrilled about the mission it's just so much more than just like hey turn a profit i i, I don't know it's a beautiful thing and I, I'm, I'm just like beating a dead horse on it but the culture there no, it's been good man and, and we've done a better job the last three or four years making sure that we hire people i mean obviously they have to have the job skills to be successful but they have to be a vision mission values fit you know they just have to buy into what we're doing. They don't have to be a person of faith. We tell everybody we interview that I am a person of faith, but you can believe in anything you want, but you can't be opposed to what I believe, you know? So I, sure. because there are things, I mean, I am going to talk about my faith around the office because it's important when we, on Monday, we do like a time of connection. It's like, Hey, what was the most impactful thing personally and professionally over the last seven days? And Sometimes I'm going to be like, Hey, pastor preached this on Sunday. I, here's my takeaway. I really enjoyed it. It really connected with me and I'm just going to be open about, but, they, but that's just a big part of my life. But, you know, but they don't have to believe in what I believe, but they do have to be okay that I believe that. Sure. And how, how's your marriage in the midst of all this? Like, how's your wife come alongside you on this? She's got to be all in, right? Cause you don't, you're, you don't go to your wife and say, Hey, I'm capping my income. <laughs> we're going to, we're going to be wildly successful, but like I'm, I'm hitting a ceiling on my own efforts and all the time away and all this. And, um, you know, what's your, what's the marriage side like for you? Well, as you know, marriage is a great partnership and, uh, you know, and marriage is not always, always up and to the right. I've been married nine years. Britt's my wife. I'm super grateful for her, but she's an amazing partner. I mean, to your point, Travis, if your wife doesn't buy in, like if, if Britt wasn't bought in, it wouldn't be worth damaging our marriage to do all this stuff at work. Because yeah. I mean, she knows this and any business owner listening knows, like I tell my team members, I mean, there are times where you're like, sometimes it would just be nice to, to be one of you guys, because as a business owner, you do feel the pressure of providing for all these families that work for you. And, you know, like it is hard to shut it down. Like I try to disconnect when I go home, but like some nights you just have a lot on your mind and you're playing with the kids and you're thinking about, I got to deal with this tomorrow and raise this money and do, you know, it's just like, it's just hard. And so, you know, you have to have a spouse that believes in the greater mission. And I think because we are so mission driven, I think if we just were, you know, running this business to make fabulous profits so my wife could spend whatever she wants and stuff, she honestly would not buy in as much. I mean, because of our mission and because of the kind of woman I married, she's more bought into anchor because of all the things we're doing and, and that, you know, she knows that our work matters and, um, and thankfully I married a woman where like that really resonates with her. And, um, you know, I, she's more excited about us giving more money away than she is about buying whatever the heck she wants, whenever she wants to. What is she, what is she most excited about partnering with you in the business for, for you know, like what piece of it is it the, the mission side of it, giving money away, being a part of that mission? Is it, 
you know, she loves raising your kids or, you know, the, the fact that she has the freedom to do that or, you know, any of the, any of that, like, what does she get most really excited about to partner with you? We had a really, uh, we had a really good discussion probably four or five years ago about this. And it was just one of those great conversations in marriage where she was just real open and honest. And she said, Hey, right now I feel very called to just be an amazing mom and nurture these children in their hearts. And she said, I love that we do this as a family. She's like, if you can send me kind of a year end report, I'll tell you three or four things that I'm passionate about. And I'd like us as a family to give to, but otherwise I trust you to make the decisions and you know, our family mission and what we stand for and what, like, you know, my heart, but like, you don't need to ask me, is it okay if we give X to what, you know, this charity or this, she's like, I make sure we include these three or four that I love and am passionate about. And otherwise I'll just trust you. And at the end of the year, you just kind of send me something and say, Hey, here's what we gave away. Here's the charities we partnered with. And, then we'll just talk about like some cool stories or whatever. So it was great because she was honestly feeling the pressure of like, do I need to go to these meetings? And I I do care. I don't want Micah to feel like I don't care, but I'm so busy raising kids and I feel so called to that job, you know, that I, so it really gave me the, it freed her up and it freed me up. And, and obviously as we get out, I mean, my children are six, four and two. So we are getting to a little bit of a more of a season where it's not just mass chaos at my house. And you got a couple so, years, man, I'm telling you, you got a couple more years before you get out of that. Space. <laughs> I know we feel it every day, and, yeah. you know, but we do talk about, especially with my six year old, we're going to start taking her to some of these inner city ministries we're involved in. She's getting old enough where she can go to the homeless mission and, you know, she can like not be running around and causing chaos. Like she'll be able to like, and then we'll be able to have meaningful conversations of like, Hey, we've been super blessed. You, you see how we live. There's a lot of people don't live that way because you Mm -hmm. know, that's one of my worst fears as a parent. And Britt agrees like, you know, the way I was raised, we had no choice but to work, hustle. Like we grew up in the inner city of Memphis, like first half of my life. Like, you know, it, it was, it was survival. My children, no matter how humbly we try to raise them, there's no, uh, there's no fooling them that we don't have excess means, but I'm trying to raise well-adapted kids who have a heart for people and realize like, we are a very blessed top percentile of the population. Like, I want them to have a heart for people that struggle and, you know, and realize that like, we've just been super fortunate in our lives. And, you know, that, that there's a lot of people out there that it's not like, I just tell people, people think a lot of people think that people that are poor are just lazy. There's like a perception. I was like, there's a lot of people like my mom who had grown up in the projects of Memphis. She was high school educated, couldn't afford college. My mom is super driven, super smart but she could never get a job making more than a very minimal amount of money because she didn't have a good degree. She was also raising five kids. She had to work nights so she could spend time with us. Like it was like, my mom could easily run my company. She's smart, driven, motivated. She's a harder worker than I am, but she didn't have the life opportunities. And those are the kind of ministries we try to partner with to help people like my mom who are doing everything within their power to, to be a great parent, provide, but just don't have the life circumstances to be able to like have any breathing room. That's interesting. You, you, I wonder, are your parents still alive? Uh, my mom is, my dad passed a couple years ago. And how, what's that relationship look like now? I mean, does she, she know how appreciative you are of her hard work and you have a good relationship and you know, she sees that your success and she's got to be like over the moon proud of you. Well, th- three days a week, she gets to see it in person. My mom's 74 years old and she works with me three days a week. So, uh, so my mom moved here seven year, seven years ago. She needed to retire. She had a job that was just a real like um, big mission. She worked at St. Jude Children's Hospital, but she worked about 80 hours a week and it was just really tough. And she was six, seven years old. And I was like, I'd been so fortunate in life. I was like, mom, you need to retire. And she's like, can't afford to retire. I was like, well, I can afford for you to retire. And I was like, and I'd like for you to move to Nashville because I have a baby brother up here. And I was like, man, you could be around our kids. She's such an amazing lady. I was like, you could have a huge impact on my kids as I start a family. I was like, why don't you move to Nashville? And we can, you know, as you get older, you're going to need help, like us to, people to help watch out for you. And she was like, man, I'd love to move. I'd love to be around you guys more. But I, uh, you know, I, I 
can't take your money. And I said, man, it'd be an honor. You gave up everything for us my whole life. Like I'd be, it'd be a privilege to be able to help you. And she's like, man, you understand this one day, but like, I don't want to be taking money from my kids. And she's like, can I have a job? I said, great, come work for me. So, uh, She's like, what am I going to do? I said, we're going to call you our director of corporate culture. We'll just figure it out. So she's got a name plaque in her office. It says Linda Locker, director of corporate culture. And I always joke with people, if if I leave the company, no one cares. If my mom leaves, they all leave with her. Like mm -hmm. I go, mom, if you were like a shark, you would just do a hostile takeover and just to, yeah. Like you just start yeah. anchor 2.0 and the whole team's going with mom. I'm like, they ain't staying with me. I promise. <laughs> man, what a but, blessing. Uh, man, it's been fun. It's been a fun season for her because I, I mean, literally three days a week, she works six hours, three days a week. And then she's a grandparent the rest of the time. But she, uh, she gets to see in person how blessed I've been. And, and, you know, I mean, as I can't even imagine one day getting to see my kids, you know, especially just how we grew up I and mean, it was truly hand to mouth. And it was like, man, she's just like so proud and, and I'm so proud of her. I mean, she, you know, I get, I, I have a, I mean, it probably took me turning 25 years old to realize like my mom literally slept like three hours a night. I mean, she was working nights. She was there in the morning when we got up to make us breakfast. And then, then when you, by the time you got home, you know, the house was clean and I'm like, and we were only in school for seven or eight hours. It's like, man, so she slept, took like basically a three hour nap, cleaned the house, prepared dinner, ate dinner with us, went back to work, did it all every day, man. And it was unbelievable. I was like, mom, I mean, you must've been dying. She's like, well, God gives strength to people that need it. And, um, you know, she's like, I, I think I was tired, but I just, it was the necessity of my life. And, um, so it's just been fun. And my siblings have done great in life too. And she's just super thankful, you know, to God. She's a person of faith and she knows that like, I don't believe in the concept of a self-made person. I mean, we're all the results of a bunch of people that have impacted us along the way. And her just, she set a great example for us. She's got to be one super proud, which I assume she is. And two, um, I hope she realizes that her impact on you and your, your siblings, her hard work is like, it has resulted in a lot of success for you guys. I, you know, passing that down the line is significant. hundred percent. And that's what I was saying earlier. That's why I want to teach my kids. Like, man, I mean, the American work ethic, you got to instill that in your children. And so we did it out of necessity, but I, I mean, I feel very strongly like my kids are going to be mowing grass and babysitting and working at Chick-fil-A and all this stuff. Because like I interview a lot of kids that are 22 years old that unfortunately this is their first job. And like, that's hard. That's you wild. know, it's hard to, it's hard to get wow. used to, but it's like, I'm like, how'd you pay for college? Parents paid. How'd you, well, how'd you get gas in high school parents? It's like, man, they're in for a rude awakening. And as an employer, you're like, I'm not hiring that kid. You know, I'm, I'm like, man, you need to go get a job for a couple of years, learn how to work. And then I'll hire you. But I'm like, yeah. you need to like go hustle. Man, that's so good. I you know, that's concerning. And my own kids, I feel the same way. Like, you know, I don't, I don't have the, the, I'm a public servant, so I don't have like the, the success in business, maybe on the, the level, not even close to the level you have. But I do know that my daughters have, you know, we homeschool and my wife stays at home with them. And this is a constantly concern is like the amount of adversity they've experienced compared to what I experienced in my, my early days, my young life, we moved all over the country for my dad's different jobs and adapting and hardships and those type of things like my daughters just aren't experiencing that and i think there's a and they're experiencing it just not like what i experienced and so at some point you know they're going to be fashioned by fire and i hope that we've trained them enough to get through those fires and and realize that they have capacity to to excel in hard moments and you only learn that by like being fashioned in fire and that's it. It's a, it's a big deal. I have a mentor. It's always said, you got to give your kids the gift of the struggle. Like it, you know, and I see 100%. that now I thought, I thought it would be easy to like, be like, you know, I got to teach them and all, but even now just having, you know, two little girls and a little boy, it's like, I could see how it's hard to let them struggle because you love them so much, but you're like, you know, my wife and I talk about it often. It's like, I know it's going to be hard to, let somebody pick on them or whatever. But like you think about how you were formed as a person, it wasn't through the, all the great times. It was through the, the hard times of life where your character was yeah. really developed and we're going to have to do it. And now at, looking back, I wouldn't give up 
those moments, those really, really difficult, hard moments for me because it, it's made me who I am. And I'm thankful for the adversity because I realized you learn a lot about yourself in those moments. And it's good stuff. Me too. Micah, man, thanks so much for the time. I know you're very busy. You got a lot going on. You're serving so many people. This has been a fun conversation. You're a blessing, brother. Well, Travis, thank you, brother. I love what you're doing. And uh, I love catching up with you at Capital Camp and look forward to being back. I'll be back next year in Columbia. So uh, thank you Great. guys for welcoming me there. They keep inviting me back to be uh, just kind of an ambassador for the state, and I love it. They they do a great job, and if if they invite me back, I'll certainly I'll certainly be there. So look forward to it, man. Thank you, brother. God bless. Right.